All right, I'm going to go. Leah, are you ready? Yes, sir, I'm ready. All right, I'm going to start from the beginning. Let me share my screen, though. Hello, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> it does this thing here at the beginning, just a second. All right. All right. Can you all see that? Yes. OK, um, I'm, my name is Austin Haynes, and I'm presenting with Dr. Leah Tarwater. And this is something that's near and dear to Leah's heart and also near and dear to mine. It's something I enjoy doing. And uh, professionally, it's what I've been doing for the last couple of years, which is helping build video content. And then we went to this model, and it became a preeminent issue for people. It was, it's sort of usurped everything that was going on traditionally in education. And so that being said, uh, I'm going to talk for just a second here, and then I'm going to let I'm gonna, I've got a slide where we're introducing Dr. Tarwater. But what I want to say to you is, um, we're we're coming at this kind of using Spielberg as just a background for this. Spielberg being one of the most famous directors. But what we want to talk to you about is uh, video development for your courses, um, how you can do that from your desktop at home, some best practices. We are going to focus in on the tool that we're presenting in which is PowerPoint, which a lot of people uh, over the last decade or so have given kind of a bad rap because uh, PowerPoint was, uh, you know, you hear the term death by PowerPoint, stuff like that. We're going to walk you away from that. We're going to talk to you about how to use the tool effectively, and we're going to talk to you about Lee, Leah's kind of evolution into this. Um, while I'm talking, I'm going to let this play in the background. There's no audio to it, so if you're not hearing audio from this video, that's okay. This is Steven Spielberg's first movie. He made this when he was in high school. Um, this is the only digital version of it I can find, so you're going to see some uh, text come up on the bottom of the screen. But there's no uh, audio for the film actually itself. He was just using this uh, to, to practice with the camera, and these are all high school friends, and then they were able to uh, – he had a relative who was in the military who was able to get access to some Jeeps and things like that, some vintage Jeeps, and so they used this to create this – short film. The actual short film itself is 40 minutes long. Um, and you can see here that he's being very creative. So right there, he's throwing a grenade. So that's just a dummy grenade. These guys are taking off. And then right here, you'll see as they take off, there's dirt. What he did was they just threw dirt into the screen whenever the uh, students were doing it. Right here, they were the student there, they, 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 they're right next to there. They buried a board under the ground on a lever and literally just put a rock there behind it out of screen. And whenever you see that dirt popping up like that, there's another person standing off camera, stepping on the board, flinging dirt up in the air, and they thought it looked like bullets hitting the ground. So this is Spielberg and a bunch of young guys um, being very creative in the way that they do things uh, because that was the limit that they had at the time. At that time, Spielberg didn't have access to the millions of dollars worth of equipment and support staff to make films like Jurassic Park and, and uh, E.T. and things like that. And so um, as you're watching this here in the background, like I said, notice that he's just playing with a lot of things like camera angle and stuff like that. So right there, whenever the kid was walking in, there was dirt popping up. They were just throwing rocks down in front of him. Right there, that kid just stepped on a board that had a lever under it, and it made it look like he was flying up in the air and dirt was blowing up and that he'd been blown up. So all of these things are just him being very creative in the way that they use the camera and the way that they use just rudimentary mechanics to create an interesting film. So the first thing we want to talk about is, and this is Spielberg's advice to uh, emerging uh, filmmakers, is start small, which brings me to this slide here. Do you want me to say that again? Yeah. Take two. Leah Tarwater, what is history? Take two. And this is where I want to turn it over to Dr. Tarwater for a second, but I do want to say, uh, Dr. Tarwater is, uh, is small in, in, in stature, so she, we're starting small there too. I think she weighs like 30 pounds. And, and then she's also uh, um, started small in her video creation, and that was where her and I kind of built our relationship because I was new and she was kind of new, and I'm going to let her take it over from here. Leah, you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks, Lester. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry, I hadn't unmuted myself yet. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I, I want to start with kind of where uh, uh, 
the inspiration from this for this presentation came from um and and that is that i'm i have been fortunate enough for the past um i don't know six months to be teaching uh doctoral students how to teach history online because i'm a history professor and um they one of their assignments is to put together a uh, an online video lecture and it's really overwhelming for them because some of them have about my skill level when it comes to technology and that is that they can use their webcam they can sit in front of it and they can talk <laughs> and then there are others who are a little bit more gifted uh, in creativity and in um, the use of technology and they'll insert music and they'll insert graphics and you know some of them do use powerpoint and um you know other sources available but after they see other students videos then they say oh well mine should be better mine should look like that one uh, and so i thought you know if they're struggling with what should my online lecture videos look like because a lot of them have been teaching college for a while then I know some of y'all probably are as well because it can get really overwhelming to know how big we can make it um, and, and maybe how creative it should be and stuff like that. Um, but I, I think when we get lost in all of that, we lose sight of what the lecture video really should be. Um, hey, Austin, can I move slides or do you have to do that for me? Hello? Okay, awesome. Um, so uh actually i think this one is totally you um you you know we have a lot of resources um at our fingertips that we don't think about and um and uh and so what we try to do is start looking for other things so it can be more and it can be bigger and it can be better and it can go beyond anything that we've ever imagined doing and um i will say that my videos the ones that i do myself not not the ones that i do with um not the ones that i do with austin those are phenomenal when it comes to graphics because austin is phenomenal um but mine are very low budget <laughs> because it's usually me and a webcam and that's it um because that's that's where my skill set lies but you can see right here um some of the the the, the budgeted resources that you have at your fingertips um microsoft teams snagit um vimeo zoom screencast-o-matic um of course microsoft powerpoint and um yes, uh, Screencast-O-Matic, you can just record your screen. Um, you can also add some stuff to it. it. There's more tools there than I realized because I just used it the other day to give my students a walkthrough of my class, which I felt like was more needed now than ever before because so many of these students that we have right now have no desire to be taking online classes. They're just kind of forced into it because of the pandemic. And so they were a little bit lost in the fall. And so I used Screencast-O-Matic to do a intro to my class and kind of walked them through where they're going to find everything. So then the big question is, why should we use videos in our online classes? Um, Y'all have students who are like me, which is um, they don't learn well just by reading. Uh, I am horrible. My, my, my uh, reading comprehension is horrible. I don't really know how I survived grad school because I struggle to remember what I re read and I'm a really slow reader and y'all have a lot of students like that who do not have a love for reading and um, so we ha really have to mix up our sources and, and it can be very easy with online classes to just assign a whole bunch of readings um, so we should mix it up with some videos uh, to give them some visual and audio uh, components as well um, we should use as many tools uh, as we can to ensure their learning. So we don't want to just use the reading tool. Uh, this is a great way to engage students. Um, students love to get to see their professors and to hear their voices. It lets them know that we are real people. We're not just, um, you know, a, a computer. We're not just um, uh, just, you know, um, somebody typing on the other side of the screen that we have no personality and there's nothing to us. It lets them know that we're real. Um, in fact, most of my students um, 
at the end of the semester, they have an assignment, uh, a, a journal assignment on, you know, what worked for the class, what didn't work, what should I change, um, what did you love the most or dislike the most. Um, and most of my students comment that my classes feel more like a face to face class than any of the other online classes that they have had before. And in the reason that they point to that is my use of videos and um, they really uh, appreciate the, the personal connection from from that. They feel like they get to know me as a person um, to an extent. I mean, as much as they could ever get to know their professor and and uh, we'll get into the different kinds of videos, but um, I do a lot of informal videos and I think that's really where they feel like they get to know me um, because they get um, maybe some personal stories about what's going on in that moment, kind of like you would do in the first or if you know when you get to the classroom and face to face classes before class starts or maybe in the first couple of minutes as people are tr trickling in and you just kind of talk about the what's going on in the world or what students are up to and they're asking you questions about your kids or you know whatever they know that you're into and so it's this really informal interaction and students really appreciate it. When you use videos, learners can pause it, they can rewatch it. Um, it's there for them <coughs> to, to use over and over and over again. Um, and then video announcements one is uh, one thing that I found is um, it cuts down on the number of emails I receive because I can see where there's confusion within the class where maybe um, an assignment instructions doesn't make sense or last semester for some reason like half of the <laughs> there were a number of links in my class that had were not working anymore I think the domain um, had changed hands and um, and so I was able to instead of emailing every student back who had emailed me about it do a video announcement hey I've fixed these or give me a day I'm finding new websites for y'all um but so you can address the whole class that way and explain it to them um especially if there's confusion it sometimes it's easier to clear up confusion by talking about it than typing about it um and so using videos really 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 has helped cut down on the number of confused emails or email questions that i get and and we all want to cut down on that because sometimes especially at the beginning of the semester we can really get bogged down in um, those sorts of emails <clears throat> Um, students believe that videos enhance their engagement and offer extra learning opportunities while they also increase student motivation. Um, this was from a study that um, I'm, my, my computer restarted. I have the name of the study somewhere and I'll have to find it for you all. But um, it actually, it was interestingly enough, it, it surveyed students and it, it found um, a correlation between how students viewed uh, lecture videos or the use of videos online to student success. So if they had a, a, a positive view of videos, they're usually more successful in the classes. Um, and so that means that we have to do videos right to give them that positive impression so that they will actually watch them. Um, and then interaction with videos add teaching presence and we all want to be present in the class and social presence to the courses, which increases engagement through the connection the students feel with the instructors um, instructors because they again see us as a real person. And we all want to engage and interact with our students now more than ever because everybody is so cut off from people and students feel so cut off from their professors. And so um, being able to engage them through video is a great a great way to do that. Um, some of the best practices really for um, uh, online videos. Um, hey, Austin, can you move on to the next slide? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. I, I want to step back here for just a yes. second. Just to let, give the audience an update. Uh, these are all the tools that are available to you. And Snagit is something I put that on there. Reach out to Pat Boudreaux if you don't have Snagit. You can do video capture on your desktop with that. Those are great tools. But we're going to talk specifically about PowerPoint at the end and how you can use that tool. We're going to focus in on that tool and I'm doing that on purpose because uh, that is the tool that I think is the most effective in doing that. If you notice right now, you're not seeing Leah or my face on the uh, slide right now because this is the thing I want to leave with uh, idea. I want to start talking to you about. It doesn't do anything for you if there's a little box down the lower right hand corner and you're seeing Leah's face and the words coming out of her face or my face and the words coming out of my face. I want to focus your attention on this content, just like you want to focus your your students attention on the content on the screen. So when we talk about and you hear the term death by PowerPoint, 
That's true because when I'm standing in front of a classroom and all you're doing to me is reading the slide, uh, that is death by PowerPoint. If you're just going through your slide deck and reading it, that's not going to do it. But Leah just did a great example of she looked at the slide content, which is what we want you to focus on, the key ideas, and then she elaborated on those. She didn't just read the slides back to you. We went down in this slide, for instance, point by point, and Leah talked specifically about these points using the language in those in that text there, but also it, it, ex, ex, uh, expunging anything that's not necessary and bringing to the forefront things that are necessary. And so that gets us to the next slide, which is this is a quote from Spielberg, stories make films and people have forgotten how to tell a story. Stories don't have a middle or an end anymore. They usually have a beginning that never stops beginning. And that gets us to these ideas here and I'm gonna let Leah talk, but at the bottom is one of the key ideas I want to keep in your mind as you're listening to Leah talk here, which is keep your video short, five to 10 minutes. You can have an hour's worth of video in a section, just don't have an hour long video in that section. But go ahead, Leah, I'm sorry. No, you're great, thank you. Um, yeah, make it interesting. It's really the the, the the key thing I can say to you. Um, and, and I think that's one thing that my students didn't understand. Like, and, and of course, bless their hearts, they're, they're, I'm, I'm critiquing the very first video lecture that most of them have done. Um, but what I found is I think what we find today in a lot of face-to-face -face classes, um, people don't know how to lecture anymore. And, you know, we, we keep being told, um, or I hear even in history, which is always weird to me, um, we need to move away from lectures. We need to move away from lectures. That's kind of dead, right? It's, it's the 21st century. We have all this technology. We need to do it different. Um, and, and, and I disagree. I disagree because, you know, lectures have, have worked for hundreds upon hundreds of years. <clears throat> so then why don't they work today? I would say that that's because the art of get delivering, writing and delivering a lecture, that's what's dying. And so we ha really have to work on writing interesting lectures. And that's never more true than when you're doing it for online because you don't have a captive audience, right? So if your lecture, if you are just listing off a bunch of facts, in a monotone voice and it is horribly boring your students will just turn it off right they're probably not gonna if they're in a face-to-face -face class with you get up and walk out um, now they might go to sleep but they're not going to just get up and walk out they're going to stay in the room because you have a captive audience you don't have that online they don't you don't see them turn off the video right so they have no problem doing that so if you if you want them to watch it you need to weave it into a narrative um of course it's teach history and so i'm always telling my students you know you've got to you know tell it as a story tell it as a story don't just list a bunch of facts um and you know it and even in in disciplines where maybe that's not um quite so easy to do fun facts are there some fun facts you can use um you know is there a story that does relate to that even if it isn't maybe something that you necessarily need them to remember but it's um it's something that will draw them in to, to, to grab their attention, then share that um, because um, we want to draw them in so that they will watch the videos. Um, if you yourself watch it and it is not interesting to you, it will not be interesting to your students. And that's, um, you know, if I'm watching a video about history and I have no idea what that person just said because I'm daydreaming because it was boring, then their students who are not history majors really are going to be lost. Um, inflections in your voice. Ah, oh, so important. Please don't sound monotone. Um, don't make it appear overly scripted. It's, you know, I always have a bullet point outline so that I don't forget to say stuff. Um, but if you can make it more conversational, make it sound more natural, um, then that's great. Now, the, the videos I've done with Austin are scripted. And so I am reading from a, um, a, a teleprompter, but um, most of my videos or, or any other videos that I do are not. Um, I use a, a bullet point outline um, to, to guide my thinking, but um, if it seems overly scripted or even if you are scripting it, make sure it sounds more conversational um, to your students. Go beyond the textbook and beyond the assigned readings, because if you are just summarizing what they have to read, they're going to stop watching your videos. This is the op your opportunity to bring in your expertise and share interesting things that you know about or or to dig deeper, um, but to go beyond the textbook uh, and the assigned readings. Um, 
so that they can learn more, so that they can dig deeper. But if you're simply summarizing what they have to read, then there's, get, there's really no point in watching your video and they're gonna see that as a waste of time. So they're not gonna watch it. Um, and then as Austin pointed out, really, <clears throat> I mean, really the two most important things is make it interesting and don't make it too long. Um, my rule of thumb is five to 10 minutes. Not that I don't ever go over 10 minutes if I just have way too much to say, <clears throat> but that's usually an informal video. And so it's not a huge deal if they turn it off. Um, and some of them do, um, but five to 10 minutes is a good rule of thumb. If you can keep it under five minutes, that's great. But if you look, um, I, I, I um, upload mine to uh, YouTube and you can see the analytics. And so I can see at what point they start turning off the video. And really about the five minute mark, it starts, you know, people start turning it off. Um, so that's about their attention spam. So I would not make it any longer than five to 10 minutes if you can help it. Um, as Austin pointed out, um, it, you can always, you know, break it up into part one, part two, if, if there's more information than you can include in a seven minute video. Um, but that, something about breaking it up where they can watch it in different setting, settings um, encourages them to watch both videos more so than it would a 15 minute video. So keep it short if you can. Hey, and uh, we had somebody who turned on their camera. If you could turn your camera off. Uh, uh, the Olka Tipness, if you could turn your camera off. I'm going to go back and I'm going to go back and share again. Uh, and so uh, while I'm doing this, I just want to say. Um, Uh, one of the things, one of the resources and mentioning it, mentioning it earlier in the PowerPoint was uh, um, the, uh, sorry, uh, slide that said this at the bottom. I'm gonna come back to this slide here. Uh, why pay a dollar for a bookmark? Why not use that dollar for a bookmark? Uh, I left that quote in there because what Leah just said, all of those things are are what in the art world we consider critiquing. We're looking at and being critical of what it is we're making. So I'm going to go back right quick and say this. Uh, you don't have a captive audience. They can turn it off if it bores them. You have somebody in your life who will tell you that everything you do is wonderful. And you have somebody in your life who will tell you the honest truth about things that you do. I don't mean that to sound like a bad thing. That's a good thing. Uh, uh, as an artist, I have a group of friends that I that look at my paintings and we love each other enough that we were are honest with each other. So. If one of my friends looked at my painting years ago and said, uh, oh, wow, I can smell the room service right on that, which is a nice, funny, sarcastic way of saying I'm making hotel art, which is fine if I want to fill the bunch of holiday ends with a bunch of innocuous, no account paintings, not good if I want to evolve as a painter. And so same thing is going on in your life. You have somebody, it may even be a student in your class who you who is asking you a lot of questions that you may want to solicit from them and say, hey, what did you think of the video and be honest? And if you can solicit that kind of feedback from students, your own children, uh, your spouse, a friend or something like that, that they will give you that information. And it's not just cutting dismissive comments, but something like it's a little long. Couldn't you cut it here? Or uh, I couldn't understand you here or whatever it is. Never take that as a negative. That is strength building. It's just like exercising. You uh, get stronger from criticism, not weaker from it. So I would just point that out as a as a really effective and budgeted tool that's in your life. And it and these videos are forever. There's uh, the thing that that I want to say that is you may make the first version of it and you may say that didn't work well or I got feedback on that that wasn't good. That allows you to edit it. There's movies before they come out, Spielberg's films before they come out, go through a process where they screen it with people in the industry, other directors, other filmmakers and things like that. And then they solicit feedback from them, not audience feedback. Like, could I follow the story? Although that's part of the feedback they get from their colleagues, but it's feedback just saying, did I go too long on this scene? Could I excise this and still get the story to move forward with that? And for you, the story is academic content information literacy, things like that. So you're looking at that through that lens and and it's important to get feedback because we can build videos and make these videos 
but if they don't effectively convey our content, then we're not doing what we should be doing, which is getting information to students that's going to help them pass the course. And so that being said, I'm going to come to this for you, Leah, because you, you kind of talked about this a little bit, but I will this slide formalizes that. Yes, so um, OK, so really two types of videos that you can use in your class and the lecture videos are going to be more formal. This is something that you'll want to make to use over and over again. So uh, this would be a video that, you know, if I'm specifically talking about the election of Andrew Jackson um, and I want to embed it in my lesson to be used every semester, this is going to be my formal video. OK, um, and so this is the ones where I'm talking about delivery is key graphics. Yeah, that's great. If you're good at that um, or if you want to go work with Austin and have him do that, then that that's great, but just like in a face to face class, as we talked about in the, with the last slide, it's the content that is the most important thing for this because um, all of the animation and all of the graphics in the world aren't going to make your video interesting to your students if what you're saying isn't interesting or how you're delivering it isn't interesting. Don't get me wrong. I mean, all of my students are not going to be interested in the election of Andrew Jackson, and that's OK, um, but I have a responsibility to, to deliver it um, in such a way that is going to grab their attention so that they can learn it. Um, you're more likely to use graphics in this type of video, but again, that's not necessary. It's OK if you do have some videos where you're just sitting in front of a camera talking to them, but Austin's going to teach you how to do these type of videos in, in PowerPoint here in a second. But the informal ones are ones that I really like, um, which Austin has dubbed my back porch videos because I tend to shoot most of them sitting on my back porch. Um, and these are more um, specific to each class like I'm going I'm, these aren't ones that I reuse OK so these are going to be individual to each course sometimes to each section definitely to each semester um, this is where my personal connections with my students are made because this is where I would you know say today if I was making a video man my boys had so much fun we had about four to five inches of snow at my house they went outside and played four times we did this this and this you know and so where I'd share some kind of personal uh, not like deeply personal but you know um, my life stuff um, to make Make those connections because then sometimes in response to that I'll get emails from students who identify with that and we get to know each other because of that um, which we wouldn't otherwise if I didn't do these videos um, but this is where I identify and address common mistakes that I'm seeing among the students. It, maybe I see that there was a concept that they really didn't get um, or they all kind of went off in this weird direction that I could tell they were a little bit lost or maybe they're not understanding the assignment instructions. Clearly, this is where I'm going to address all of that stuff and post a video. Um, I also do in the discussion, there's a lesson questions discussion that they can go and they can ask questions about readings, about videos, um, about the topic they're learning about something that they're curious about. And throughout this semester, I will um, make videos answering their questions. And this is kind of to give them the face to face feel because if they're sitting in a classroom and I'm lecturing and they have a question about something, they're just going to raise their hand and ask me that question. Well, they don't have that luxury in the online class in 99% of my students won't email me with that question. But if I create a discussion board and they know that I'm going to respond to that in a video, they are much quicker to ask me questions. And so again, that that um, really engages them. It, it, it leads to more interaction between student and professor and um, they learn more in that way and we make connections that way. Um, and then I typically embed these in announcements and then email them out to the whole class. So the informal back porch videos aren't in the lessons. Um, these are just uh, communication to the whole class through announcements to again answer questions, address misconceptions, um, make personal connections is the purpose of the informal videos. Yes, and they and and, and just to kind of reemphasize this, uh, this is where Leah really kind of advanced video content development in a very uh, human way. Uh, because we would make these videos, very formal videos that we'll talk about here in just a minute, which had graphics and were scripted and Leah would literally be standing in front of a teleprompter reading from that and she'd be going over the history of some insurrection or uh, uh, some government standard or some big moment in history. And then she would let the students watch that. She would solicit responses from them about what was talked about and then she would get those questions and it allowed that back and forth and in African culture they call it a call and response and that's what I would think of whenever I would see Leah's videos because it would just be her sitting on her back porch going uh sorry Leah hey y'all uh <laughs> yeah I saw that y'all asked this question 
about this content. And it was a very human moment. It was that moment that in the class come up and they have that question. I asked like, hey, I didn't want to interrupt you while you were lecturing, but I have this question. And Leah would take that moment to talk to them. And as we all know, uh, in a face-to-face -face class when that happens, there's students who are filing out of the door and they may not know that that question was of value to them, but because the video is now embedded and it's something that they're going to engage with, even if it's just cursory, they may go, oh yeah, I didn't think of that. And it allows students to grow more in it. And I'm big on building a better world to live in. And that's how we do it because a lot of times students don't even have the ability uh, in blooms to understand the part where they may not be understanding it. I don't mean that to, to, to be disrespectful to students, but it may be that they're at a place in their own intellectual engagement where they're like, I don't even know if I, that's a good question to ask because that's where we hear that statement of, this may be a dumb question, but, and since Leah is asking it, people start to realize, oh, wow, that wasn't a dumb question. Somebody else asked that question. And those are things that are embedded in this practice that allow students to grow beyond even maybe their own uh, academic growth uh, potential that they were aware of. They, they start to become very much aware that they're not alone in their feeling of ina inadequacy as far as a subject, and it allows yeah. them to grow. It to build on that, I mean, it does, and it, and it gives the whole class kind of a sense of community because they understand they're not the only one who was off point or didn't understand that fully. And I will say that the back porch videos, as much as my students love the videos that I did with Austin, with all of the awesome graphics, it is the back porch videos that gets the most response from my students um, and the most uh, uh, feedback at the end of semester, uh, positive feedback as far as what they really, really appreciated out of the class. They love the back porch videos. Yes. And so that brings us to, sorry, uh, to this slide here. <laughs> yes, so how do I know that my students are watching these videos? Um, well, as I uh, mentioned earlier, I upload my videos onto YouTube, and so I, I embed them from YouTube into the class, um, either into the announcement or into the lesson. And so in, in YouTube, you can view the analytics. You can see, of course, how many people watched it, how long they watched it, at what point during the video people start turning it off. Um, and so that gives me an idea of, you, of how many of my students are watching it. Um, if, if I have a semester where it looks like nobody is watching the videos, like I have between three classes, you know, 90 students and 10 people watched one of the videos. Mm. Well, I then start adding a word of the day um, or something like that into the video. And, um, you know, somewhere in the middle, I might say the word of the day is, um, you know, Texas. And then in one of their next assignments, it's going to ask for the word of the day. And then they have to tell me that. And so then you have students who start panicking. <laughs> um, where do I find this word of the day? Well, watch my videos. Um, and so that actually, you know, that or you can always build assignments based upon the videos. And once you get them watching your videos, after they watch a couple, they're they're more inclined to watch more. Um, I think in the beginning, they're just kind of like, eh, I don't need to. But if they find out that they need to and they start watching them, they're more likely to continue watching them. But it is so important to remember that some students are just not going to watch them. They don't care if there's a word of the day. They don't care if there's an assignment tied to it. And so I can either be really consumed and frustrated by the fact that I have these students who won't watch the videos that I work so hard to make, <laughs> or I can understand that those are the students that probably weren't coming to class in my face to face classes, you know, and, and there's only so much I can do. I can email them. Sure, I can reach out to them but I can't make them want to learn. Um, but I have this whole other group of students who are in my class to learn. So rather than being consumed and frustrated by the group that doesn't, I'm going to focus on the group that does want to learn and I'm going to continue making my videos and making them as engaging and pos as possible and creating that connection for that group of students, that group of students who is there to learn, to be educated and to grow. Um, and so it's, it's easy to get lost in the frustration of how hard I work on these and these and how much time I put into it and these students not um, watching it, um, but we just have to choose which group of students we want to focus on in that situation. Yes, and uh, and I just want to uh, build on that for just a second here. Sure. Uh, that same that same philosophy there is it goes going back to the previous slide when we were talking about uh, students being able to get, learn a new subtext that they that they're learning something about learning that they didn't realize they were learning like other students are asking some of the same questions that they're embarrassed to ask. 
same thing there. Some students won't watch them and I can either be consumed and frustrated by this. As educators, sometimes we get into the throes of education and we get into the day-to-day -day minutia of teaching our classes. And I hear some of the same frustration with teachers when it comes to testing. There are students out there che cheating. Yeah. There are. It's a small amount of students. It's This is not to preach to you, but this is just it. It's the same thing. There's a small amount of students out there who cheat and you can either be consumed by that or you can move forward and teach to the ones that aren't cheating. And I promise you, it's a small amount. And there's research on this that those students that are cheating, they're going to continue to do that as best as they can, no matter what tool we put in there. Y'all are doing a fine job. We don't have a massive problem with te with uh, cheating. And that's something to learn along the way, that, that your focus on this, the, the learning to engage your students with video is the same thing as cheating, is the same thing as am I doing enough? You're always trying to do the next thing and evolve to the next level, which brings me to this slide, which is going to look really boring. Um, this is this is what you normally see when you're building a PowerPoint here. And I just put these numbers on each of these slides to cut to so that there was something there so that you could see there's multiple slides inside of this PowerPoint. So this is a still image and we're going to go into this PowerPoint here in just a second and talk about the tools. But these this is why I think PowerPoint is an effective tool. You're going to make a video. You're going to put that video in your course and you're going to get feedback from the students. Some of that feedback may just simply be that the video was really effective and they passed the content associated with that video. They watched the video. They did the assignment that was following it. They were successful with that. They took the quiz on the content that was related to that video and they passed with flying colors. And then you can kind of step back for a second, take a breath and say, OK, that was awesome. And I guess that video was really effective or it may be completely counter that and it may be they watched the video, they did the assignment, it flopped terribly, they took the quiz, they flopped that terribly. You can look back and say, hey, I, I didn't cover that content effectively in that video. This is why I like PowerPoint. So if you're not familiar with PowerPoint Show, PowerPoint Show is you can slide right up here and you can go to Slideshow and you can record a PowerPoint Show. We're gonna to get to that in just a second. But I wanna show you first in these slides why this is effective. When we're building a PowerPoint, this is the traditional view that most people build a PowerPoint in. And then inside of PowerPoint, there is this view. You go over actually over to view, uh, if you look up here, and then there's a slide sorter, and you can see all of your slides in, uh, in sequence to each other. So that's why I put the numbers on here. And so you can see all the slides. And then down below these slides here, you can see the time signature for the audio file for each of these slides on the slide. So that's telling you, that I spoke for six minutes and 39 seconds on this slide, three minutes and two seconds here, a minute and 58 here, and so on and so forth, okay? So this just 21 slides is over an hour's worth of video content here, okay? Way too long to slow to show to students. And so this gives us a chance to look at that. And when I mentioned editing before and, and looking at it and being critical, I can now do this. I could come up to home and save and save as and i can save as this video version two i can go in and i can go okay great on slide seven that's a great place to cut this out so now that i have version two i'm going to cut out the first slide seven slides and now i've got eight nine ten eleven twelve all the way to 21 and i can look at that content okay so that's one way that we can edit and we keep all of our content and we look at it and we look for natural breaking points in our content to shorten our video length. Okay, now let's say on slide 13, after the students have watched this video that I made from this, on slide 13, there's some information that I left off that I wished I would have put in slide 13. And, and if I'd have put that in there, I would have had a higher pass rate on the quiz. They would have been much more successful in their uh, um, assignments associated with this video. So what I can do is I can go to uh, view, okay, and uh, slideshow, and I can duplicate this slide. So I'm just going to duplicate slide 13. So now I've got slide 13 in there duplicated. I can go to slideshow, go to record slideshow, go clear timing on current slide. Notice that, notice that this slide, there's slide 13 here that's 535, and there's slide 13 here that's 535. I can clear the timing on the current slide. I can clear the narration on the current slide. And that will clear this out just on this slide. And then I can record that additional content 
on that slide. And whenever I make re, re uh, format this as an MP4 file as a video, the students are never going to know that I changed. That is the exact same content. I just added that content to it now, and I didn't have to remake my entire video. I have just remade that one slide in relation to my content, and that allows me to control it. So all I have to do is save this slide, and I'm going to slide out of my uh, slideshow for right now, and I'm going to go to my desktop. And this is, uh, sorry, this is my example video here, okay, that I made. And if you look here, I've got slide 13 where I've got the content on it. I've got slide 13 here where I don't have the content on it. So all I've got to do is come right back up here and record slideshow, and it's going to start recording from that slide. I can record whatever it is I wanted to add to that slide. And then I'm going to save that again, and I didn't have to record all of this up here again. I'm able to edit my content from semester to semester to best suit my students. Once I get that feedback, whether it's the students saying to me in comments, man, Mr. Haynes, that video was so long. Please, for the love of everything that's holy, don't make videos so long. Art was just simply looking at the grades and going, oh man, I really should have mentioned that uh, Thomas Jefferson doesn't have wooden teeth because apparently that's something that's out there that the students think. So whatever it is at that point, you can come back in and helpfully edit, edit that back into your tool. Uh, you may have this or you may not, but once you've recorded a video, if you're not familiar with this, you're just gonna slide back up here to file, go to export. It's gonna open up this window on your desktop. You can come down here, you can save it as a PDF. You're going to want to save it as an MP4, not an MOV. That's the largest file, and that will eat up a lot of space. MP4 is an effective file. It keeps all the uh, um, graphics and everything at a high pace of re resolution. It allows the video to be saved in a way that students will easily um, be able to access it, and it, it, it's going to load uh, a lot easier to YouTube. Uh, MOVs will load to YouTube, but it will take them longer. It'll eat up a lot more of your bandwidth at home, especially if you're out in a rural area and it will take you an hour to load up a five to seven minute video, whereas an MP4, you may load it up in a minute, minute and a half, two minutes. So um, though that's the tools. If you don't have that feature on your version of PowerPoint, you can uh, send those into the ID department here at Tarrant County College. Uh, that's David Denny. Or I'm going to come back into my uh, PowerPoint show here because on my last slide, I have questions because we're, we're getting to the point where we're supposed to be as soliciting questions from all of you folks. Um, so my last slide is uh, this slide here uh, with Dr. Tarwater, who is not a full time employee. I just put her on there in case you wanted to email her a question, um, but she's not a full time employee and, and she's not responsible for this. She, she, she'll help you, I'm sure, if, she, if you catch her at the right moment, but she's also teaching and busy and about the business of being an instructor. But um, I am glad to answer any questions y'all might have about videos that I can't answer. <laughs> yes, she's awesome. She's awesome that way. And so if you email her, if you email me, if uh, if it's something related to video, I can help you. I'm in the instructional design department. And if you just email uh, the instructional design department here, uh, e-learning uh, at Tarrant County College, they'll, they'll be able to help you also. So that being said, we wanted to open it up for your questions, comments, concerns, needs, whatever, and uh, we'll be glad to answer them. And that was a minute. I was right on. That was 1044. That's pretty good. All right. It sounds like y'all are all good. Oh, wait, is my microphone on? Yes, you're good. Hey, I have a question. Um, okay. uh, so if when we go into PowerPoint, where do we go to um, record? OK, great. That's great. Uh, so when you go to PowerPoint, normally and let me show you this in real time. This is on this this slides that we just the slide deck that we just did. So normally you're going to see it in this view. This is standard view. Over here, there's slideshow, and that's going to allow you to click here, and you're going to record show, and you're just going to record slideshow, and that's as soon as you click that, just to be aware, if you've never done this before, as soon as you click that, it's going to start recording. You're going to start seeing a timer going off. Um, you're going to see it up in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, there's going to be a red dot uh, on both um, Mac and PC versions of this telling you that you're recording and you're going to be recording from the moment you do. Uh, uh, that's a great question, Lee, and I, and I forgot to mention this in there. When you advance to the next slide, you want to stop talking altogether. So if I'm recording my show, and I'm going to do that right now while we're doing this, I'm going to click record show, 
And what you're going to see is this. Um, I'm going to swap displays. And this is what the display looks like because I have multiple displays set up. Right now, I've been talking for 10 seconds on this video here, you can see. And I can end the show if I want to. I can swap displays. All my slides are down here. Normally, when I'm recording, I would be seeing, once again, this. If you have a single display, you're just going to see this. But if you have two displays, you will see this screen, and that will let you know that you're doing that. When I'm recording, I want to stop talking, OK? Whenever I advance to the next slide. So I'm going to actually stop this, this, this show right now because I was on the wrong slide here. I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> uh, bring this down and I'm going to bring up this show again. Sorry. Uh, we'll forgive you. That's all right. And sorry. And so here's here's my show. OK, and so I'm going to start on this slide here and I'm going to start to record my show. And so here's my show and I'm recording my show and I'm talking whenever I want to finish and I say do it yourself Spielberg making engaging videos with Dr. Leah Tarwater and Austin Haynes. As soon as I finish this slide and I want to go to the next slide, I want to hit advance to the next slide, but I want to quit talking. So you're going to notice we're going to go to the next slide and I'm going to quit talking. So I'm, you're going to hear me hit the button here. And I wasn't talking as an advance because it cuts off the audio as you go to the next slide because each audio file is indigenous to the slide that it's that it's being spoken over. And it's so that you can edit it in the way that I was talking earlier, and that's a built in feature to PowerPoint. So when you hear somebody bad mouthing PowerPoint, there is a lot of uh, structure inside of PowerPoint that makes it a highly effective tool. So when I'm making this video now, I'm, I'm talking, sorry, my voice is breaking. Uh, when I make a video and uh, talking, and I'm going to go to the next slide once again, I'm going to stop talking. And now I'm going to start speaking again so that there's not clipping in my voice and so that the students don't feel like they miss anything. It's very important to do that as I'm presenting and as I'm speaking here. And so now I'm going to go up and I'm going to end the show. And if you look, sorry, I'm going to go ahead and kill this PowerPoint here. Uh, don't say if you look now, the time signature is on those three slides that we were talking. And once again, I can now go back in and I can highlight this slide. I can go back up to slideshow and record slideshow, and it's going to start on this slide. If I if I don't do this, if I if I click on this one, it's going to record over that, and that 22 seconds is going to go away. But once again, to show you how to edit, if I only did 14 seconds here and I'm like, oh man, I should have really did this, I can duplicate the slide. So now it's 14 and 14. I can highlight the slides. You can see that it's outlined here. I can come up and I can say clear, clear timing on current slide. So you notice that the timing went away. And I also need to clear narration on the current slide. And if you notice the star went away. OK, so the audio file and the time signature is gone. So now if I want to add content to this, I can once again come up here, record slideshow. It's going to start on that slide and I'm going to add content to this slide. And if you notice, up here again, now I'm at 118, and so it's running concurrently. It's telling me how long this presentation is going to last from the beginning, and I'm adding more content to it. So right now I'm adding content to this slide as we're talking here, and now I'm going to say, okay, that was what I wanted to add, and that on this current slide I've now added 22 seconds, and it's going to be a little bit longer whenever I click the button here, but I'm going to end the show again. And now if you look, I'm at 27 seconds. When I make the video, the image is not going to change and the students are not going to know that I uh, extended that video. It's going to stay exactly the same. So this is a really safe way, uh, effective way. And uh, uh, let me let me use this word because I like this word, potent way to make content because I want them focused on whatever it is. When we were talking to you about this slide, I wanted you to be focused on that information. I wanted to elaborate. I wanted to give it uh, uh, extended content there. I don't want to just read the PowerPoint. That is deaf by PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Then you could just drop the PowerPoint deck in there and say read the PowerPoint deck. But I want your voice in there as an instructor. I want you to be focusing them on the content. And then the back porch videos following this up humanizes this in an incredible way. Natalie's in here and she does this. Uh, Natalie is the queen of the, I'm going to call them mom jokes because it's disrespectful to say that they're dad jokes whenever they come from family. But Natalie is the queen of the uh, mom jokes because she makes some great little jokes that help her students. They're like mnemonic devices. They help her students remember uh, the content inside of her course. Allegra very much humanizes her course. She's got a lilt, L-I-L-T, 
to her voice in her course that uh, very much humanizes it and very much allows the students to engage with her. So she becomes she comes across very human. Dr. Sullivan is uh, is my uh, sister from another mother. I, I love to watch her video content because there's that hint of sarcasm, but also that awkwardness in it that is uh, uh, reminiscent of my own teaching style because I'm never really am comfortable in front of the camera because I uh, just am not. And I think that that's evident in Dr. Sullivan's <laughs> video because <laughs> yeah, I think they're awesome. But I think that that shows them that y'all are human um, and it shows them that the content in your courses uh, is just an extension of you as a faculty member. And it, and, it, and your voice in these very formal videos is, is, is very concise and there is no backwards and forwards to that. It is a reflective mirror of you. But whenever you take away this and you put the back porch video in it, it's no longer a mirror that you're showing them you. It's a window and they can see you and they feel like they're engaging with you. And I will say that is very effective. And so when we're talking about videos, we're really talking about you being able to be effective as an instructor. And I just want you to know that these are some of the best practices for that. Uh, if you're going to be on video, wear a shirt, don't lay on your bed, be kind of formal. <laughs> Uh, this sounds crazy, but I'm just saying that there are. Yeah, videos it does. That I happen. mean, it, it. Yeah, there are people who do that for sure. Yes, ma'am. And so, just think about the presentation you want to give to people. Yes. Um, you want to and come. And be across. aware of your background. Yes. Don't wear a T-shirt that has some slogan on it like Coors Beer or something like that because you'll lose your audience. I know that sounds terrible, but it's true. Uh, I wouldn't wear one that had, you know. Uh, Batman on it, and that's something I'm interested in, but that's not what I want them focused on. On my personality video, when I'm doing my introduction, if I, if I chose to do that, yeah, we're talking about me as a person, and, and my t-shirt, if it's appropriate, may just say, oh yeah, that guy really is into comic book culture or something like that, but okay, not pretending to them. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, somebody asked, you're using Office 365, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then somebody else um, asked about a how-to YouTube training video on the process of creating video lectures on PowerPoint. Um, any you want to point them to, or maybe yeah. that's just something we could search I, in YouTube? I actually have one online awesome. for, uh, for our courses, so if you'll email me, austinhaines at tccd.edu, I will email it to you. Um, just so you know, it was made in response to going home from COVID, so it wasn't the formal one that I've been working on, and I haven't finished the formal one. But that's my goal is actually to have that finished here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but I do have one. It breaks some of the rules we talked about today because it's about 15 minutes long, but it does walk you through the process of doing that uh, and, and gives you all the ins and outs of that, uh, including some of the tips that I've given you here. Uh, so please don't judge me too harshly on that, but it's really effective and it has quite a few views and I've got a good feedback from it. But I, I, I broke it down into three shorter videos is what I've broken it down to. And, and my intentions are to load that here in the next week or so. But I'm gonna leave the other version up because it's been effective. And so just because you did something and, and you've advanced that, don't kill the other version. The, people learn in different ways as Dr. Tarwater mentioned earlier. So whenever you make a video, unless it's got a complete and other failure in it, don't judge yourself harshly on that. Um, the, the, the video that you made, the rough one, keep it. Always keep a copy of it because you're learning from it and some of your students learn from it and keep it to analyze it, but also keep it maybe as a an alternate version because it's okay to have multiple links to multiple videos and let and just alert your students to it. Say, this is one I made earlier and it may be the one you get the most out of. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's just part of the process. But yes, I do have a video. Thank you very much. Thank you both for an awesome presentation. I just wanted to say real quickly that the attendance sheet link should be in the chat. And there's also a link to the rest of the sessions um, throughout the day. And so hopefully um, you'll all have an idea lab to, to go to at 11. But I just wanted to say appreciate the awesome presentation for both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for letting us. Thanks, Leah. Sure. Thanks for right. organizing it. <laughs> Y'all be good. We'll see you on the other side. Take care.